Thanks for doing this, pal. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I there's so many different directions we can go, but uh, <laughs> and I got a feeling we're going to be all over the place. <laughs> but uh, tell me, just give me the the, the five minute tour of your life and how you got involved in medicine and, and yeah, how you kind of how you went from a young child to today. <laughs> okay, uh, you know that's that's a, that's a tough thing to do in five minutes, but I guess oh, growing up, of I, course, I, my parents took me to a chiropractor since I've since I've been little, so it's been something that has been a part of my life for for quite some time. But mostly I went to the chiropractor growing up for aches and pains. I played sports, soccer, basketball, baseball, and we were there just kind of to take care of some general ailments and some some hurts and things along that nature. And it seemed like a pretty cool profession. Like growing up, he was a fit guy. He seemed to always have a good tan. He went on nice vacations. He had a nice car. So as like a kid, I'm like, all right, this is, this is cool. You get to help people play sports and you seem to be doing all right for yourself. And then I guess like when I was in college – is when it real. I went to college to be some type of healthcare provider, and my mom got sick. She got diagnosed with cancer when I was in college, and that was tough. And we went and did the whole medical route, and we had conversations that were very difficult in terms of here's prognosis, here's what is expected with this particular type of cancer, and all of that conversation was was pretty negative and pretty difficult. And I can remember like she went to the chiropractor, she's like, man, this stress is getting to me. This is difficult. I want an adjustment. I want some relief from just the stress of what's going on. And he began to have conversations with her that were very positive, that the body was designed to, to heal, that uh, the medicine that you're taking, thank God for that. But we want to help to equip the body to utilize that. And that conversation, like I saw like kind of a light switch change within my mom of being like very down to like okay, maybe there is a light at the end of this tunnel. Maybe I'm going to be healthy. And I'm happy to say now, I guess she's probably a 20 year cancer survivor wow, at this point. Great. And I'm not saying that, that like chiropractic did that, but what I am saying is it was like that moment for her where she began to see not just I'm a cancer patient, but there is something beyond this terrible diagnosis. And, and that's when I was like, man, forget the cars, forget the, the tan, forget the vacations and stuff. Like, man, if I can have those conversations with people and, and just like empower them whenever it comes to their health and the difficulties that they are experiencing, man, like if I could do that for a living, like sign me up. That's, 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 that's all me. Wow. So that's, that was a turning point for you then. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest misconception you still believe in 2023 that we have about chiropractors? Oh man. The biggest. Okay. There's probably a litany. Yeah. But. I mean, there, there is a ton of them. I, I think, um, you know, generally whenever somebody comes into the office, typically whenever we meet somebody, they're coming with neck pain or low back pain or shoulder pain or, or something along those lines. And there's a ton of questions. And I, and I think we had mentioned this earlier, like, TikTok has been wonderful and terrible for the chiropractic <laughs> profession. At the same time, they're like, are you going to twist my head off like I saw in that video? Are you going to get out a chisel? And I'm like, like, listen, like, this is not a barbaric thing. Like, chiropractic has come a, a long way in the last hundred years. I mean, we do a very thorough evaluation with somebody whenever they come in. We spend 45 minutes to an hour discussing what it is that's going on. We take digital x-rays. We, we analyze those x-rays. So it's not like a, let me just push on your neck and see what kind of happens. It's a very thought out process in order to bring somebody some relief. So I think the, the biggest misconception is that, oh, you're just going to walk in and they're going to crack your neck and it's either going to be better or not. There is a ton of thought that goes into an appropriate chiropractic adjustment in a treatment. So has that evolved? Because I can remember being taken to a chiropractor in the late 70s as a child after a baseball injury okay and my father was like oh that's voodoo science and my mother's like well you know let's just do what we're what's recommended by his gp well, that was awesome that you had a gp in the 70s yeah that but i'll that. tell you what man like i i felt amazing when it was done but it was there was a stigma yeah this guy's going to crack my back. This guy's, and he started, and he was like, you know, was your young kid, you're 15, 16, you're laying in there and, and the, the weight of the, the chiropractor came and put weight on my back. And it was, it was a, the process because I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And I wasn't told the, the, the bedside manner was like nothing at that time. <laughs> it was like, lay there. The next thing you know, you're okay. It was just the, the, the setup, the delivery of it, the execution of it. The effects were wonderful, solved the solved the problem for me. But it wasn't. 
I won't say not taken seriously, but let's just say the opinions of chiropractic has certainly changed. And I would agree. And I think for some of that, it's better. And for some of that, that is worse. I think for chiropractic, for me, the proof is in the pudding. And most people who receive adjustment, like, oh my God, that's exactly what I needed. That that feels great. And they got that get that relief. Right. But leading up to that, there is some stress and there's some anxiety and there's some questions. So I like to think that we do our best to try to explain, here's exactly what I'm going to do. Here's why right. I'm going to do it. Here's what you can expect whenever this happens. Um, and that is part of our patient process and our educational process because jumping on somebody's back while the outcome of that is positive there can be a lot of anxiety and if somebody tenses up then that makes my job a little bit more difficult so i think uh you know it was great that you had great relief but i think chiropractic as far as our explanation as a profession has improved over the last 30 years 40 years well do you think people in general just are yearning um and have been for you know 20 years especially the last 10 years i would say just yearning for better understanding of what's going to happen to them, uh, a better understanding of chiropractic. Uh, maybe there's a little bit more healthy distrust of traditional medicine just being prescribed traditional medicine. And I think that's 100% it because when somebody comes into the office, they're like, listen, I, I don't want drugs. I don't want steroids. I don't want painkillers because, you know, here in Western Pennsylvania, I think we all have stories. We all have people that we know that have had struggles yep. with those mm -hmm. particular um medicines that are out there, whether they found them recreationally or prescribed. So I think a lot of people are terrified of living with pain and what the medical approach to dealing with that pain looks like and are looking for solutions um, more natural, much more congruent with maybe their philosophy of health and well-being. So I, I, I think that actually like the pain management that has been appropriated on the American public over the last 20, 30 years has terrified a lot of people and had them find chiropractic that otherwise might not have 20 to 30 years because of the horror stories that are out there with the opioids and, and the different pain management techniques that, that exist in the world today. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeking, to some degree, it's probably healthy that we're taking more ownership of our, our health as a people yeah. are we or aren't we no i think i think we are and and i think i think we are and we aren't i, I think there's a, definitely a divide in terms of of how people move towards their health but to me i think the way that medicine should be going and needs to be going is much more patient involvement and patient dictated and not so much medical doctor dictated because there's and i shouldn't say medical doctor i should say you know chiropractic as well like here's what my approach is and this is what we want to explain here's what my approach here's what i want to do here's what i think's in your best interest are you comfortable with that and i don't think that conversation happens a lot in a medical setting it's here's what we're going to do here's what we're going to take here's the prescription go fill that and i i do think that that has equated to a society that has become very dependent on a medical system that is in many aspects in my mind failing a lot of Americans health. So to me, I want to be able to empower patients. And I hope that the chiropractic profession in general wants to empower patients to be in the driver's seat and the chiropractor almost in the passenger seat as somebody that's there to help guide and be the navigator in terms of where that individual's health, like, hey, here's where I want to get with my health. And it's not me saying, here's the roadmap to get there. Let's figure this out together. What, what works for you? That's totally 180 from the very top down managed way that most Americans get their health care. It's like when you, you know, you walk into the door, we're not doctors. So we almost have to bow down to, this is tradition. Yeah. Bow down and whatever the doctor says to do, then you must, it's almost like a mandate. And the, and the industry almost kind of bought into it themselves and delivered you know, prescriptions or, or prescription of medicine that way. That's it. That's the, that is the current allopathic healthcare model. Here's what you're going to take for X, Y, Z symptomatology, and then we'll see what happens. But the problem is X, Y, Z symptomatology, you go on for a medication and 30 of the effects of that medication aren't a desired effect. They're a side effect of that medication, which becomes and causes that individual to become more reliant on the allopathic medical model because I went in with X, maybe X was helped by the medication, but now I have Y and Z as a result of that. What do I need to do, doc? And then now the doc is again in the driver's seat making all of the decisions and the patient is just along for the ride. For the seniors, I noticed too, uh, they become very, um, they end up becoming very dependent on that doctor. And like look at that like doctor. Gospel. That's 100% it. Doc said this. Well, oftentimes, and it's difficult to have this conversation, but 
how's that working for you, uh, older individual? Right. And when you ask that question, sometimes they get up in arms like, well, th- th- what else am I going to do? Um, some people are like, well, you know what? Maybe maybe it's not working the way that I wanted. And I have been dealing with this issue for quite some time and I haven't been able to find some relief. I'm open to the idea of adding in chiropractic or some other type of modality on top of what it is that I'm doing for a better desired outcome. So I definitely think that there's a like a cutoff and, and it's hard to say what that age is of some people who look and say what my medical doctor said is gospel to others are saying, I'm not sure he truly understands my unique situation. And I'd like to have a conversation with somebody to try to understand me as an individual as to what makes sense to me as opposed to me as trying to fit me into some type of box. Does that make sense? Certainly. Yeah. And I I think the the quick and easy way to treat patients decades prior, um, you know, generally speaking, is to find a box and stick them in there and treat them with prescribed medications. I mean, I'll share this with you. So I went through a difficult time in the uh, early 2000s where I need some help and uh, anxiety um, from various reasons. And it was the, the quick fix um, that my GP said, well, uh, I'm going to try this cocktail of, I think it was Zoloft and Xanax, a time-release Xanax. And okay. we're going to wean you off the Xanax and increase the Zoloft doses and and I, you know, the Xanax media effect in terms of like calming, right? Say, okay, but the Zoloft really wasn't working for me and I wasn't feeling great with it. And then he goes, oh, we'll just try you on this. We'll try Selexa. And at, when he said that to me, I go, well, because I didn't know. I'm a yeah. patient. I don't know. And he went on to explain to me, well, we know that these certain serotonin up take inhibitors affect the brain in certain ways. And each medicine does something a little different. And I go, so it's like a crapshoot. You really don't know how my brain is going to react and my system is going to react to this medicine. So we'll throw it at it for, for five, six months. And if that doesn't work, we'll throw this one at it. And we'll eventually find something that sticks. Now, there might be a lot of truth to that. And it might be the way things are done. I get it. But to a person, to a thinking person, which I always pre- believe I am, I'm like, well, Am I like a guinea pig? I mean, how healthy could that be putting medicines that don't agree with me repeatedly till I find something that quote unquote works? I think you made the perfect I statement I was horrified. There. Yeah. You said you're a thinking person. You're thinking about that. And that, and I think that's half the problem, maybe more than half the problem with, with medicine today is the doctor's probably has all the right intention in the world. I mean, I don't think anybody goes into medicine saying, I want to harm somebody or I want to make somebody's life more dif- difficult. It's just those are the tools that are in their toolbox. I give medications, and if medications don't work, I give more medications. If that doesn't work, then let's try cutting something out and referring you to a surgeon. Like, that's almost American healthcare. We'll just prescribe you a medication for a problem. In this case, it was Zoloft. Hey, this is working pretty good or whatever it is, but they want to wean you off of that and try something else. To it gets to a point where no medication is working, then they go off label. Like, let's just try this and see what happens. And if that doesn't work, then you tend to get referred to a specialist. So in that case, maybe a psychiatrist or somebody along those lines who's going to prescribe you a special medication in that particular instance. And when that doesn't work, now they've exhausted everything. And typically now in this case, it's not going to go to a surgeon. But if we're dealing with like some type of organic pain, or blood pressure or digestive issues. Now we're going to send you to a surgeon and see if we can't just remove that body part. And then if that doesn't work, like, well, now you're a lost cause. How did we get to this point? (laughs) Yeah. And and I think that's just because of, well, there's, I guess there's a million different ways of how we got to that point. I'll tell you, (laughs) in my opinion, I think the reason we're there right now is dollars and cents, 20, 20 cents out of every American dollar that is spent is in the healthcare system. So if you take a look at, at GDP in America, 20% of that is treating sickness and disease. That's not promoting health. That is treating a sick society. So when we take a look, 20% of the American economic platform is on treating sickness. If all of a sudden that goes away, what happens to all those jobs? What happens to all those individuals? What happens to that industry? could be devastating on an economic standpoint. In my mind, as far as a health standpoint, I think we take a step in the right direction of actually putting time and effort into prevention and building health as opposed to trying to rectify and maintain disease once it manifests inside of an individual. And and, and I just want to be clear because I, 
I, I think when I make that statement, a lot of people are like, he hates doctors, he hates medicine, he hates drugs. I think there's definitely a time and a place for it, but it shouldn't be our first resort. And right now it's our first, second, third resort. And when that doesn't work, now let's go see the crazy chiropractor down the street for maybe some nutritional advice or for some exercise advice or for some type of supplement. I, I think it should be the other way around where medicine should be our last resort. Well, it's interesting because uh, go back 20, 25 years when the or maybe 30 years when the term holistic started, you know, I, I'm not an expert in it, but I believe the AMA and so forth, they came down hard and did their best to uh, to villainize or, or yeah. of that that concept of anything holistic. I'm talking as crazy as eating a you know grass or someone who really <laughs> was taking it seriously in, in blending traditional medicine with holistic procedures. But it was really um, attacked. For lack of a better phrase, this is just the, the public view. It's, it was. It still is. I hear, I hear it every day. Like, oh, you man, you're, you're crazy. You're telling me like I should just eat well and exercise and detox and maybe take a couple of supplements and get adjusted. We're yeah. not getting smarter. I, I think we're becoming more indoctrinated into the mindset of wait a minute, like okay. I'm, f I'm about ready to turn 40 and most of my friends who don't prescribe to a holistic lifestyle, they're already on one or two medications. The average American right now at 27 years old is when the average chronic disease begins to develop in America. So essentially wait, wait, that- Wait, back that up again? 27 years old is when the average chronic illness begins to affect Americans. So 27. 27. 27. That's the number. So what that essentially means is that like, you know, if we have a life expectancy now to like 76, 80 years old, that's five decades of an individual becoming reliant on some type of medication in order to sustain them. Yeah. And this is the problem as opposed to, hey, from birth to essentially death, let's do everything within our power to live in congruence with the way that our body was created and designed. Let's eat well. Let's try to minimize stress, which is very difficult in 2023. Let's try to utilize our body. Let's take care of our frame and our spine and supplement in certain areas that are beneficial to our health and the well-being. And let's try to push back that chronic illness and disease age so that we can live a vibrant life. We just unfortunately are not seeing that in 2023. And that's what the medical data is like. This isn't a chiropractor saying this. This is this is published medical journals that are saying how sick we've become. OK, so let's bridge off a little bit here. Yeah, man. Um, let's talk about obesity for a second. OK. OK. And. And I say, you know, I like to talk about this subject with as much kindness as I can possibly give because it's coming from a place of kindness. Um, but it's it's no surprise. Uh, you go to a mall, which they're not really heavily populated anymore. But if you go to a mall on a weekend and you look around or go to a baseball game and just look around. My, my uh, wife is a flight attendant. You look at you know, people squeezing in the seats on an airplane it, we are not in a good place right now as a population and i'm sure it's a world population but let's just talk specifically the u.s we're not in a good place not even close and and to your point i i think that it's getting worse like we probably have access to better foods now as far as health food stores go we have access to phenomenal gyms that um work but the problem is the quick and easy thing after a busy day is to swing by and pick up some type of processed food, to binge watch TV, to not go outside and have a catch with your kid in the evening because you're exhausted from the way that the world is. And I'm not pointing fingers because like you had said, we don't want to do that. But right. the reality is when you take a look back at our, at our population, we are certainly overweight and we're certainly bigger than we've, than we've ever been. And there are dire consequences as a result of that. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, like the big three diseases that we manage and treat and that ultimately kill Americans are much more prevalent in an obese individual um, succumbing to a pandemic. We saw that those individuals that had the worst outcomes were bigger. So that was my challenge in 2020 and something that I really encourage people like, listen, if you if you have a comorbidity and your idea right now is to stay at home uh, to protect you and your family, which is your decision. And I'm not here to point fingers. That's great. Like stay on the couch, avoid people for a period of time until this thing passes over. But if you're still on the couch when this thing is done and you're not back into the gym and you're not doing things to truly promote health and well-being inside of your body, in my opinion, you took the easy way out because all of the data and all the research, both holistically speaking and medically speaking, pointed a finger that and if most you, people did take the easy way out. Right. I, I, most. I think. In, but the, to, to their point, I didn't want to take the easy way out, but I couldn't go to the gym. Gym was closed. I couldn't get in. So what did I? I had to figure out how to utilize and to move my body. And I had to be that weird guy out in my 
uh, in my driveway doing push-ups and running up and down hills and doing that in a way that I think a lot of people probably looked at me like, here's the crazy guy out running around the neighborhood without his mask on. But it, like what in my in my look of, at you it, got some of that, too. Oh, man. Yeah, you got all kinds, <laughs> got all kinds of that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I I think you're spot on. And I I. I you know, it, it's it's like it blended into a whole nother reality where uh, for a short period of time, we became so caustic with each other during that period that somebody who was taking their health seriously or looking at me, hey, I'm going to do what I can do to keep myself, uh, give myself the best opportunity. That if I do get COVID, you know, it won't the impacts won't be grave. Correct. That's was my thought was just let's do what, what I can, what I can control. I will try to control. I I think that's a beautiful thing. But but again, I I think a lot of people didn't. And I think a lot of people just put themselves in a situation of I'm going to avoid everybody at all costs. And then I think we really saw you had mentioned earlier the the um, the mental aspect of that. I mean, the depression, the anxiety was through the roof. I myself became incredibly anxious during that time as a business owner. Like, are they going to shut me down? What is this going to look like? What does it look like for my kids going to school? Of course. Um, You know, I, I had a kindergarten. So my boy right now is nine. My oldest. But at that time, he was in kindergarten, and, and we did the virtual learning thing. Like, how that? On, yeah, that, I'll tell I you, love, he's in I, private school right I, now. I, I love, I <laughs> just love, love asking writing that, that number, love, that check oh every every month. God. But like, he oh. he's a you know every I think everybody looks at their own kid, and be like, he's a great kid. Yeah. He listens. He's well behaved. He was turning the computer off. The, he never used a computer because we're not big in technology in our house. Yeah, he watches TV. He just got a switch at nine years old because all his buddies have one. He's been asking for it. But up until that point, he's like what is this thing? Oh, there's somebody there. Is that even a real, he just kept shutting it off. And we were like, well, we've got to figure out something because if we don't do this on our own, if we don't take responsibility for his education, he's going to be way behind. So that was an incredibly stressful and difficult time as well. But I mean, I'm not saying that my stress was any worse than anybody else's. I realized it was stressful for everybody, but that was this unique, unique perspective for us of, of where he was at that point of his life. Yeah. I mean, for sure. It, it's it, and those who did take, uh, you know, care of themselves or try to make changes to the positive on the physical part were looked down negatively. Like, you know, you're, you're going, you know, you should be in hovering and masking and staying away. And it wasn't, I mean, I remember going on, uh, going down the Montour trail there and really starting my, my, uh, my fitness journey right at the beginning of the pandemic because I couldn't work. I figured, well, I want to get myself straightened out here. But just the, the scorn levels, were, it was amazing. It, like, was, like, it was it was a weird – can I tell you one of my favorite crazy. stories about 2020? Sure. So we were – I mean, this was probably like – I guess the weather had just gotten nice because there's people out walking. So it was probably like April, early May. And we're driving down Route, Route 19 in Mount Lebanon. And there's a lady coming toward us. So I'm driving north on Route 19. She's walking south but on the same side of the street as me. And she comes around the corner um, and, you know – she she had the mask on coming towards me so she she was protected or whatever it is that we want to call that and then there was somebody also walking north so she saw like oh my god there's a human there's a sidewalk like i don't want to be near this person i want to do the six feet which i'm I'm not pointing fingers at her like at that point like if you want to avoid somebody avoid them at all costs but the idea to avoid that person isn't to walk on to route 19 so at that point like she stepped in front of my vehicle i'm in it with my three kids and i had to veer out of her way like so she was so afraid of coming in contact with a human being that she stepped in front of a car and at that point i'm like this is where we're at we're making some some crazy decisions like i would much rather succumb to a virus than get hit head by by a a car head on like that's just my personal view of the situation and it was terrifying to pull over my wife had to drive the rest of the way i mean we literally had to swerve out of the way to avoid this woman and it it, it was scary but i think a lot of the decisions that were made at that time and i guess the point that i want to make is that the decisions were oftentimes made out of fear Mm -hmm. as opposed to making a decision out of at that point, probably common sense and the decision that she made, but long-term vitality. Sure. Well, talk about vitality for a second, because I'm going to guess back to the obesity equation. I mean, you know, vitality is that part of the byproduct that should be, I would think would be alluring to someone who's not in shape, who's overweight. I mean, the vitality they can get and have on a daily basis would be, I don't know. I mean, it's, that that's the sexy part of the journey. 
Um, but but I, it's not sexy enough to get more people to do it. And and I think there's there's multiple levels to that because these are conversations that I have every day with patients. And I definitely know that of my overweight patients, um, and, and we love them to death, but they're, a lot of times their concern is like, I don't want to be working out next to like you or me who's, you know, fitter than the average population because I feel down on myself. But the reality is like, man, if I go into the gym and I see an overweight person sweating and working out like just me and my I'm smiling. I'm so happy for that person. I'm like, I'm I'm giving them thumbs up. Like there is no judgment at all coming from me on 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 you right now in the gym. The only judgment is coming is like, man, I'm proud of you. Like, let's get after this. Let's let's do it. So I, I definitely think that there is a maybe a self-conscious aspect to going to the gym and i just wish that more people would be like no man like we want the gyms to be packed we want people to be working out it doesn't matter what your body shape is if you're in the gym sweating and working out we know that as a society we're moving in a direction towards vitality and the health and the well-being so i would hope that maybe two or three people that are listening to this right now that maybe have that thought process uh they go join a gym tomorrow and just know that, that there is a ton of support in that gym and a, and a lot of help in that gym I'll take a step further from my vantage point. If if you initially if the hang up is there, then why not go out on your own and just start getting your body in motion? And then I, then as you gain more confidence, maybe you shed a few pounds, you start feeling better about yourself. Then migrate to a gym. You can take a walk around a block, take a longer walk and a longer walk, get a, at a brisker pace. There's things you can do alone. Just start the process. Am I right? And that's it. Just and start the process. And if you need help, um, there's a guy named David Goggins who was in a really bad shape and really turned his life around by, like you had just mentioned, just like going and doing something a little bit more each day. David's story story is amazing. It really is. Yeah. If you can get past his coarseness, which if it's long, it doesn't offend you. But yeah, it's a. I'm a big audio book guy. I I listen to a ton of books. And that that one, that was a tough one to listen to. The great thing about that audiobook, and I encourage someone to, to get David Goggins' original story, the, the first book. The great thing about that audiobook is during the, the chapter breaks, he would then talk with the narrator yeah. in these little mini podcasts. So he gave a different perception of the each chapter. I, I think, it was I think his story is beautiful. I think he's a great motivator. It's amazing. And I think a lot of people that are in that industry and like the motivation and the wellness, like they were born blessed with maybe higher muscle mass and better endurance. We know that his situation wasn't that. Like right. he, he really struggled with his weight, with his health and with his well being. And through essentially just brute determination was able to turn that around. And, and I think that it takes that type of a mindset. And I think it takes more of that mindset with an individual who struggles with their health and with their weight, um, than, than somebody else who maybe doesn't have that struggle in order to like really get going. But I think once it gets going and and once somebody starts moving in that direction, like it, it really is a beautiful, wonderful thing to see somebody's life just to go from like that caterpillar to that butterfly really quick. Oh yeah, and, and once you just once you just start, you know, and and continue, and you start, the momentum builds exponentially. Yes, and all psychologically, physically, when you see yourself shrinking, when when you see when you see yourself uh, beating the goal from the day before, and it, it's a constant, never ending improvement, and it really. I honestly believe that if someone truly wants to make a difference like that, it's not too hard to do. You can start in the simplest ways. I agree with that. But I think the uh, – and we had mentioned this earlier. I don't know if this was during our pre-show conversation or, or on, on here. But I think, like, the Instagram, the Facebook, like, all of that stuff does give a misconception. Because, like, for me, I go to the gym. I, I lift heavy. I, I move around a lot of weight. I go to a spin class every Friday. And everybody in that spin class is fitter than me and is super healthy and super well. And then people ask me, like, well, what do you do to work out? And, and my mind goes, well, here's what I do. But the reality is, like, you can't do that. Like, you're not ready for that. Maybe for you, it's just getting up and walking around the block. You don't have to do what I do. You just got to do a little bit more than you did yesterday. And I think that's where the misconception is, is that people think like, oh, I got to go do a CrossFit gym or I've got to run a marathon in order to work out. But the reality is it's like, man, just walk around the block. Once that becomes easy, go around two blocks and then just keep building from there. Uh I think we overcomplicate it. And I think the fitness industry has definitely overcomplicated it. And I think the fitness industry is awesome once somebody has established themselves in the fitness world. But so many people they don't know where to start and we start very very simply one push up one yes. walk around the block yeah and and, and it, it's a bigger um or it's i guess i should say a commentary on the bigger issue and that is that 
you know, Instagram goes from zero to success <laughs> in like 10 seconds. Yeah, and it, it's if you're lucky, right? It's instant gratification. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and, and it's so true. Like, you know, you're not, if you're 310 pounds, you know, and six foot tall male, uh, super out of, out of shape, never done anything. You're not going to look like that muscle wound guy by next Thursday. Correct. It's just not it's going not to happen. happen. It's a process. Yeah. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And, but but we really do sell instant gratification. We do. And we do. And when it comes to health in general, it's never instant. Like th- for me, I've been I've been kind of living this lifestyle for 18 years. And there's I should say since I was 18 years old, it's shoot, it's been quite a bit longer than that. But um, you know, it is that it is that journey that doesn't really have an endpoint, if you will. I guess yeah. the endpoint's the grave, but like how long can I push back that time frame Certainly. is always my mindset and how can I get to that grave as healthy physically and mentally as possible? And we do that through living in congruence the way their body was designed. We're designed to move. We're designed to eat real nutritious foods. We're designed to have a body that isn't crippled with with pain and with arthritis and degeneration so we need to take care of our joints we need to minimize our stress uh, and we need to figure out ways that whether that's spiritually whether that's uh, physically like whatever it is that we need to do some of us need to start off with some type of pharmacological agent i think mm-hmm. that there can be some some benefits to that in the short term but ultimately it just comes down to what does the human body require what does it need and how do i give it that and then you just do that every single Okay, so let's talk about food for a second. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I don't even know which direction to go here. But yes, processed foods are horrible. We can spend an hour on that. It's almost like we are almost drunk on the sensation of, is it satiety? Is that what I'm, am I saying correctly? Like, yeah. Like, what is it about the human condition that we're so... We, we have found pleasure, an immense amount of pleasure in food ingestion, in food intake. Is, I, is that actually normal, though? I, do our I, ancestors do that? Yes. So when we go back to the beginning of time, when we go back to our ancient, ancient ancestors, like eating when there's food in front of you is important because we do not know when the next meal is going to come. Now I'm talking like caveman. I'm talking Neolithic times. So I think from the beginning of time that we as a human species will, if there's food in front of us, we're going to consume it because our minds and our physiology is programmed that we don't know where the next meal is going to come from. The problem is since probably shoot 1930, I don't know really to put a a specific decade on that, like food's no longer an issue. Like even and we can go back to the obesity point, um, the lower economically speaking we are an individual is the higher the obesity rates go. And that's really backwards. Like typically people that didn't have money, historically speaking, were the thinnest because they weren't able to get food. That's not the way that it is anymore, that the overweight tends to fall into um, the lower social and economic class. And that's because processed food has become incredibly cheap. So for me, like. I love to cook. I love to eat. I am also genetically programmed. Like if there's a pizza in front of me, (laughs) it's really hard for me to say no. Like I I just, I'm programmed to eat pizza and drink beer. I guess that's just kind of how I go. But I really do my best to, to minimize putting myself into a situation where that is in front of me. So when I'm cooking at home, we're, we're buying our, our, our own produce. Sometimes we're growing our own produce. We're getting that from a farmer's market so that we're minimizing that. And we're able to t- make that taste great. I've got three kids. We've got number four on the way. And my kids will eat just about anything that's put in front of them, healthy speaking. And oftentimes we'll like, oh, we, we, like if there's candy in front of them, Sometimes they're like, Dad, can I have? But more often than not, like, that's just not like what the Pattisons do. Like, we just don't overindulge in that. And, and I, I've screwed up so many different ways with my kids. But I think in that specific, specific act, um, aspect to our family dynamic, we, we tend to choose good foods over, over poor foods more often than not. So you're saying the lower the socio- socioeconomic uh, demographic is, the more obese they yes. are. Yes. Because the food that is, that is financially attainable for them is of poor quality. Correct. Yes. So you think about it like if I if I take my kids out to eat, like the other day we went to a porch up at Siena in, in um, Upper St. Clair. And we got salads and like, you know, but the reality is when you sit down and eat that way, like, 
you know, family of five right now, it, we don't go out to eat in anything less than a hundred bucks. It is incredibly expensive to go out and eat healthy where you could eat a family of five at KFC for 20 bucks, you know, 20% of what, what I, what I, so the, the costs of getting full on processed foods is quite a bit lower than it takes on non-processed foods. And we see that the individuals who do struggle economically speaking gravitate towards those foods and it's just the way of the world like i only have so much money to spend and this is what i can feed my family with so that's what it is but it just turns out that it's terrible food yeah i it, are you familiar at all with uh historically like how we got hooked on corn syrup and wasn't it there's i i saw this story years ago i don't know if it's really true but there was a push for I read that there was a push for wheat um, to be proliferated throughout the globe. And I think it was the late 60s, early 70s, I think the Nixon administration, because it was a way to feed the world. Okay. And then out of that movement came the processing of corn, because corn was plentiful, and we found they derived a sweetener from that, which was cheaper than cane sugar. sugar. Is that correct? correct. I mean, is, am, I, am I on to something here? Again, I, I haven't read this recently, but... Yes, the wheels are turning in my head that this was the proliferation of how high fructose corn syrup has come to the utilization that it currently is. Yeah, and it's in it, it, everything. Again, it comes back to what you mentioned before, you know, taking the time to take ownership of your health, but ownership of your diet and, and really trying to start to understand what are you ingesting. And I don't think most people give that a thought. It's like, oh, there's food in front of me and I'm hungry and I'm going to eat that. Um, but the thought beyond what that is, if you actually start reading ingredient labels, you're like, man, I don't want this in my body. I don't want this in my kid's body. I just never really took the time to turn that over and look at it. And we had mentioned earlier about some of the facetious um, ideas as far as medicine going. Food's the same way. Like there's plenty of times that I'm walking through the, the grocery store and I see a new product and it looks incredibly healthy. Like the marketing of that product is so spot on. I'm like, that's what I want to try for my family. And then you pick it up and you turn it over and you look at the ingredients. You're like, no, that's got to go back on the shelf. This is terrible. So there is a ton of manipulation that goes on behind the scenes to get us to make the choices that we make in terms of purchasing these foods thinking that they are good well, look products at, look at the proliferation of margarine 40 50 yes, years ago margarine man. as opposed to butter give me the butter <laughs> give me the butter I mean, but but if you remember the commercials from the 60s the 70s and the 80s and the 90s butter we margarine butter bad margarine yeah we were a margarine good. family growing up in the 80s man like that's that was what was in the fridge and it was affordable look at, but look at the Look at the ingredients on margarine. It's terrible. Yeah. So like the canola oil and everything that's out there is is really, really processed and really, really bad. And one of the things, and I think let's let's take that like seed way, oil, right? Seed well, canola is it actually canola is not a plant. It it comes from a rapeseed, which is grown in Canada. Right. Canola is an acronym, Canadian oil low acid. Yeah. So Whoa, yeah. Back back. yeah. See, <laughs> there's most, no canola plant, man. Yeah, most of the public would probably think yes. that canola oil is derived from the canola, canola plant. plant. Yeah, I did for the longest time I too. Just, I just did up until about sixty seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is a it is a, a food product. I don't even know if I want to call it food. It's a product that's made in a in a lab and in a at this point a, a huge industrial complex that creates this. But it is by no means a natural product and it's everywhere because it is incredibly affordable and it's addictive. So high fructose corn syrup, these particular types of fats, the human mind, like we had talked about our, our Paleolithic ancestors, like something incredibly sweet and something loaded with fat was very high in calories. So we tend to seek those foods out because our Paleolithic ancient mind is saying, I don't know where the next meal is coming from, but the reality is it's 25 minutes away for a lot of people and we're just constantly putting these really high caloric terrible foods inside of our body the the point that i wanted to make earlier though is like we're made up of of cells every single organ every single tissue inside of our body is a cell and every cell has a membrane and every membrane is made out of fat so to me and to my family and the way that i approach nutrition is like if i want to be healthy as a as an organism as a human being i need to make sure that my cells are healthy and in order to do that we need to be consuming 
healthy fats. It's Absolutely. really a beautiful thing. Uh, we're pregnant right now with baby number four. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And all of our children were breastfed. We plan on breastfeeding baby number four. But when you take a look at the brain, so I'm big on brain health, brain's 73% health of fat. So if we want a healthy body, we need to have a healthy brain. And breast milk as of itself, if you to take a look at this, how beautiful nature is, how beautiful the body is, is 73% saturated fat. So we're literally like designed to have the perfect food given to us at this young, beautiful age. And that like is going to build us to grow into a healthy adult. And then somewhere along the line society says let's go screw this up as much as we can <laughs> let's demonize let's, saturated let's fat. demonize the perfect food that is out there now i'm not telling you to go eat a stick of butter i think there's definitely some negative consequences to was that. that because the cost of uh other fats on a wide basis was cheaper and can be more mass produced. Than I don't think it was originally done facetiously to harm society's health. I think it just happened to be that this particular food was easier to produce. At the time, the science was telling us that saturated fat was bad. So let's go ahead and throw science. And I'm using my air quotes right now in terms of getting the society to eat this. And then you had mentioned earlier about being a guinea, guinea pig in medicine. Well, yeah. it wasn't just you as an individual. At this point, it was society at large that was a guinea pig. And we realized, man, we we really screwed that up and how much sickness and disease and human suffering was a result of poor science and poor decisions being made from the bottom the whole way up. You had mentioned, you know, the president of the United States at that point making right. these decisions. Right. Um, when, when poor science is followed, um, negative consequences equate. And, and I think we saw that with, that. I think we're still feeling it uh, in, in, in the incredible proliferation of, of corn, high fructose corn syrup, and its derivatives, I also think that we are, uh, I believe that we're drunk on wheat and wheat products in, in everything. Wheat shows up, if you look at labels and really look at a variety of labels and different kinds of foods, wheat is in everything. everything. And if you go back, and we keep coming back to like this Paleolithic stuff, but if you take a look at corn, high fructose corn the syrup and stuff. wheat, yeah, like we're nowhere near the the actual natural plant that should be. It's been so manipulated through the years, through yeah, both the original wheat seed, the, yeah, yeah, man. Like it's, uh -huh. it, I don't even think it exists anymore. No. I think we only know it through fossil records. So like this, the, the human body hasn't spent a millennia trying to acclimate itself to this particular food, and it was like just thrown to us essentially overnight. Whenever you take a look at the time time frame of human beings. And it's like, well, now we're starting to see the negative consequences that are associated with that. And I don't know the math and I don't know the numbers on this, but I would imagine that the vast majority of the calori the calories that Americans consume is in corn and wheat. And it's nowhere near what our ancient ancestors and what our genotype. And when I say that, I mean like the genes that make mm -hmm. us up are um, able to actually turn into and utilize as energy and food and food and fuel. I read a book uh, a decade ago called the wheat belly yeah that's uh pool malter yes. that did that yeah, yeah it's that, a good one that changed me and then i started um i read a book called the primal blueprint by mark sisson okay from the mark's daily apple and that led me down this whole um it just opened my eyes it opened my eyes to how we kind of got here from and he was uh, Sisson's whole thing was uh, the primal primal blueprint was eat more like our ancestors. It was not pure paleo, but it was close yeah. to it. Yeah. It was just and and we just consume so many refined and refined carbohydrates. The average American hundreds more grams per day than we need. Than to. we need, yeah. And 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 it's and that number is probably getting higher. It's not like it's not like the science is now showing that it's a problem. But the economics behind it is that there's I, I don't think there's any insight. I would say if we were to look at a graph, they're still going up in terms of us as a society yeah. at large consuming these things. Yeah, it's uh, and saturated fat is so demonized. And it's it's just I, I was laughing the other day. I was going through. Um, do you remember uh, maybe a decade or two ago when um, soy milk became the rage. Yeah. Right. Soy milk was the thing. Like, you know, let's not drink milk. Let's drink soy milk. Okay. And if you rolled that carton around and looked at the ingredients there, especially the sweetened version. Yeah. Not, not only was it putting an ungodly amount of estrogen in males when consumed on a regular basis. <laughs> Besides that, the sugar content, the carbohydrate content was higher 
than every type of milk, it, even from skim the whole. It's like I'm having a conversation with one of my chiropractic buddies. Like most people have no idea what soy does to a man. And yeah, man. I, I, you know, I, I, I take. I guess pride in my masculinity, and I guess in 2023 you got to be careful with saying that. I don't know, yeah, <laughs> but um, no I, I want to av- I want to avoid that all costs in my body. I want to avoid that all costs in my son's body, but at the same time, I want to avoid that at all costs in my daughter's body because I want them to mature in a way that is supposed Natural. to happen. Right. And you know, I remember growing up in the 80s, like when young girls began to mature was in high school that's not that's like junior high now man that's like elementary school where we're starting to see some of these changes of life begin to take place and in my opinion it has a lot to do with the amount of soy the amount of chemicals that we're doing which is changing hormonically and the hormones hormones in the milk i thought and in the meats i thought that they want to 70s they they want to point that that, now hormones and meats is a problem so when when i'm mentoring somebody on food supplies and things of that grass line. fed you're looking for grass fed but even that can become a problem now pasture raised is the is the actual term that you want to be using now and because you know the, the chicken like grass fed and the beef like again the marketers got a hold of this and they say okay so how many square feet is a studio right now Four thousand. Yeah, four. Th- <laughs> I'm in a mansion right now. <laughs> four hundred. <laughs> okay. Four ten. <laughs> so in in this in this space, like I could have a cow in here, and and this would be considered grass fed, but a cow requires a lot more wow. grass than this. Okay. So when we say pasture raise, like literally, that means that that cow was granted x amount of yards for itself okay. in order to consume it is difficult to find like literally whole foods and maybe some online markets um Eastern food co-op right. here in pittsburgh has right. it so you really got to be careful but butchers are awesome like there's only a f- that used to be like growing up my grandma we'd go to the butcher every it day was, with it, was grandma. A thing. it was a thing and yeah. he was covered in blood but i thought he was the coolest dude in the world and the cleaver <laughs> yeah and then it went away right it went away for a while but i think butchers are like maybe barbers they're coming back in vogue yeah and yeah. to be able to have a conversation with a guy who's cutting your meat like you know right there like that is a a, a, a knowledgeable conversation that I'm having that I'm about to nourish my family with. And the guy who's producing that meat or at that point processing that meat, I want to know what I'm eating. 100%. And to be able to have those conversations is, is really, really valuable. So um, I encourage people like if, if, and, and I, I get it, like, finances are always a decision that we make whenever we begin to eat better. It's going to cost us more. Yeah. Start with your proteins. Yeah. Fix the proteins first, figure out how to fit that into your budget and then begin to add in the other stuff. And I think people kind of go backwards. Like, Oh, I'm going to buy organic this side of the other start with your protein. You'll get your biggest bang for your buck and then build off of that. Well, I think that's interesting. You said that. So the organic thing has turned into a marketing, the the, the organic branding of food has turned into something. that's hard to trust now. But to your point, this is my problem with veganism or vegans, the vegetarian, the, that, that movement is that um, it's not a problem. It's just my disagreement is when you basically tell someone that if they go off of meat, it's not only a better way to live and it's more humane, it's actually help you lose weight invariably what do they do they load up on all the things that are not related to correct. animals correct which is like bagels and cereals breads and, grains. And, and it's it's that's the stuff that's starchy stuff which that's is causing does. their blood glucose levels to just skyrocket that's what does it there and 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 again we there was actually i think this was like on oprah or maybe like dr phil like one of those like early 90s shows that was uber popular but they actually had this pretty interesting uh concept on i shouldn't say concept science they had a nutritionist on and they had somebody eat a snickers bar and they looked at their blood glucose and then they had somebody eat two pieces of whole grain toast and blood glucose levels were actually higher and i think three out of the five individual testing now obviously it's a very very small sample size but they were higher in the whole grain toast so like i'm not saying that it's healthier to go around eating snickers bars than whole grain toast but we really need to realize like we don't see our endocrine system changing when we consume food in the short term i think in the long term if you look in the mirror you take a look at different biomarkers yeah you're going to begin to see that over a period of time but it's very difficult to understand what goes into the body and i think you've done a great job of educating yourself and knowing and making some decisions that are going to build you for success where most people are just like, yeah, the marketer said it's good. Let me eat it. It's not hard though. I think that's the thing that I found. Uh, it, for me, doctor, I went from uh, the beginning of the pandemic. I was two forty two. 
Oh wow! And I just said I, I didn't you, like man. the mirror. I'm like, I didn't. How did I get here? This is just this is gluttonous. This is ridiculous. And I just slowly set on a path, changed everything. It wasn't, but it, my point was, if you want to do it, it really isn't hard. And I would venture to say, for those that seem like it's insurmountable, once you get started, it's like not not only is it not really hard, it's actually fun it's to see the change. Fun. Yeah, and because it, it builds. And, and it builds. I'm a competitive guy. Like sports were always my thing. Uh, music certainly your thing. But like to me, I like to have a scoreboard in my life. Hundred percent. And, and it's really neat about your health is that you can you can have that scoreboard in so many different Keep aspects. Score. Yep. And some of us maybe it's the the number on the on the scale, or but the apps or what? Yeah, devices, man, it makes whatever. it super easy now. But mm-hmm. we can we can really get those competitive juices and compete against ourselves yesterday. With if you're going to compete against somebody, like forget about competing against exactly. the Instagram models. You're not going to win, exactly. man. Compete against yourself and, and the society, or I'm sorry, the technology that's out there now really allows us to do that and track that appropriately. Yeah, and I think if you, you got to record. You got to be, you, know, you need to know where you are. But I didn't find it difficult. And, and, and you know, life at 172 is a hell of a lot nicer, a, a better of a life than one in 242. I've, I've lived both. And I can assure you, friends, I'll take the 172. So let me flip the script right now. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Like, what did you do to find the success on that? How did you go from 240 ish down? Like, what was what was your focus? How did what was your? Yeah, uh, I looked at everything. I looked at my haphazard way of approaching food. I didn't really. Um, I would binge. So if I if I would eat eating something, I would eat a lot of it. Okay. I'm like, oh, I can I can eliminate that. I can, I can change that. Portion then I, control then initi- was a- initially and, and walking. We'll get to that in a second. But the portion control was okay. Let me get my portion controls under under control. And then I started like, wait a second, that's still a small portion of something, but that's something that's still really shitty. Yeah, bad. Yeah. I just started flipping things over. I knew they were bad, but I, I didn't know how bad yeah. until I started flipping things over. And then I started realizing. I came to the mindset that, look, I don't need to be obsessed by food. I don't. I, I started using food as a tool. Now, granted, if there's a great pizza, great. It tastes great. Have a great steak once in a while, great. I can enjoy things like that. But I don't lust after that. Is it satiation? I'm not whatever the correct word is. I'm following. I don't, I don't lust after it. And then I just started examining and started building some routines and, and I, like the bread, you know, I just basically said, well, if I'm going to eat bread once in a while and do it right. So I went and I bought uh un, un, or spout, sprouted, sprouted bread. Yeah. yeah. Food for life, uh, sprouted grain bread, not flourless bread. Right. Oh, I started feeling great. My system was reacting to it. Great. I was, I was regular. I, I, my, my, all of my systems in my body were reacting to the change in diet along with walking and running and jogging and just, being disciplined about it. And I had nothing else to do because the pandemic shut us down. So that was your focus, man. Yeah. It was on you. And then once I got it figured out and I went from a size 36 to a 34 down to a 32 and, you know, and I'm late fifties, you're wearing a 32 inch waist. That's a pretty, that's a, that's a high. Pat yourself on the back. That's man. a high. Yeah, but as sure. a male, you know, at my age, we're able to think, well, shit, I, I'm wearing 30, 32 size. It's to me, that was a marker. I yeah. wanted to get there. That was a high. Cause, cause I looked around and, most people aren't there. Yeah. So I was doing something in my mind different than the fray. And I think that that's what humans want to do. They want to see achievement in what they're doing. Yeah. And then when you make those changes, and I'm sure you probably notice this, your sleep improves, your mood A improves, your libido improves. Like all this 100%. stuff gets better. You when feel younger. Feel good, man. You feel, yeah. For me, it was just feeling younger. Yeah. Like I have the energy and the vitality to do the things I want to do. Yeah. I think a lot of people that maybe struggle with their weight, I don't know if it's an excuse or not, but they're just like, well, I don't care how I look. Well, great. I true. don't either. But I think more often than not, like I don't it's it. not about what you look like. To me, it's about how I feel. And I want to. I want to wake up and we're like, man, let's go do something today. Let's have fun. Let's make a difference. And I think that's not entirely true. I, I hope so. I think I, I honestly, no, no. I think that you're right. That that's the that's the that's the most important component. But it's not entirely true because I do believe, if given the choice, of a, of a guy walks in here and he's two forty, and you say, I can show you a path in six months. I mean, this is, I can show you a path that if done religiously in eight months, you'll be one seventy two. You, you think can, most people are going to take that path? I would hope they'll so. They'll take they'll take the dream of that 172. Yeah. If you got a magic pill that would do it the next day, <laughs> not, given the not, given the yeah. choice, where would they prefer to be? Yeah. No one prefers to be 
where they are if they're not happy with what they see in the mirror. They yeah. can say, I mean, it's it's a defense mechanism. I I believe, just my opinion, to say, well, I don't care what I look like. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Deep down inside, you're lying to yourself. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just being my we're, naive we're, and we listening to the levels, words that are coming out of levels of vain. We, <laughs> you know, we, we need to be honest with ourselves and say, so you're saying at 300 pounds, you wouldn't rather be 200 pounds? Come on. Be honest with yourself. And I think once we get to that honesty, that maybe then the change can Then the start. change can happen. Yeah, maybe that's it. I, again, just my thoughts, but I, we lie to ourselves so much to make up for our inadequacy. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's let's and like no tell ourselves a story or whatever it is that we need to do. I, I'm big boned. Okay, that's great. Or you know, I have a, a, a thyroid problem. Okay, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I guess that's where the disconnect for me is, doctors. I people ask me how'd you do it. I'm like, well, okay. So I generally tell them, but I don't get too deep deep because it comes back to haunt me often. You know, it's like it, it, I just think that. My wife has a habit of watching this show on television called 600 Pound Life. Or I've never watched it, but I've, I've seen it as I'm there's scrolling the, through. Or there's one where there's this doctor who does weight loss surgery, but the people have to lose weight first to do all this. And the thing I don't understand is I don't, I'm not saying it's easy, but I don't understand if, if you are a certain weight and you don't like that weight, less food in will ultimately slowly get you the result you want. It's real simple math to me. Cal calories are a thing. Carbohydrates are a thing. Manage that. Even if you're lazy, invariably, your weight will come off. Yeah. We know what to do. We just don't, don't do, do it. it. Yeah. And, and I think it's because we don't see the results immediately, right? It does take time in order to lose weight. Now, eight months isn't a long time to lose the weight. But for some, it's like, man, I didn't see the results tomorrow. So I'm just going to go ahead and eat the pizza today. Or, you know, I'm going to make an excuse or whatever that looks like. I think that there are a ton of psychological issues that get in the way. But more often mm -hmm. than not, like you had mentioned, it losing weight and getting healthy is a gritty thing. And I would venture to say that we as Americans have gotten away from that gritty mind of thought of what it takes in order to life's easy. find success. And it has become incredibly easy. And in an in, instance, in, in, and I think any time that life becomes easy for a period of time, that lesser amount of output in your life is going to equate to a very hard life down the road at some point or another. And I think some people experience that. I'm sure a lot of people experience that every single day, that the easy decision doesn't equate to the easy life. Often the times it, it equates to a very difficult life. <laughs> I've, been, I've been saying this on this podcast for four years. And it's just too easy to survive. I mean, we, we live in 2023 where food's cheap. That's it. And, and I think I mean, 2020 really put us into this like survival mindset. But like when it comes to my family, I don't want my family to survive. I want I want them to thrive. Right. right? Well, There's a big difference between that mindset. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. But it's but I'm saying it's just too easy to survive, period. Whereas, you know, we go back decades where if you didn't work you know, and become industrious and so forth, then you wouldn't be able to support yourself. You almost were forced into being industrious so you could make it. Even yeah. if it's a even if it's a very humble life, there's mechanisms in place now and there's lots of entertainment, things to do, and you can kind of skate by if you just want to exist. Yeah. Those mechanisms weren't around then. So it, our, it isn't just food, it's our whole lifestyle. I just don't... I don't know where we're going with it, but it just seems to me it's just too easy now. And then what? what is that? I mean, I don't think that we as a society say, OK, let's flip the switch and make it harder because the harder lifestyle is going to equate to a better society. Like, how do we fix it? I, I don't know. And I don't think either of you and no. I are saying that we have no. any solutions no, to not that at all. Other than the outcome of where we're headed is is it, it can't be favorable. And it's too and it's too easy to say that we're just lazy now. I don't think we're lazy. I just think that given the opportunity to have all these different distractions, we're kind of like migrating toward them. You know, the tons of entertainment stuff. I mean, you, you think back in prior generations where you didn't have a phone that could give you a myriad of information and entertainment at your fingertips all the time. You have to look forward to things. What do we look forward to? That's a good point. I think a lot of people look forward to when's my next favorite uh, show going to be streaming on Netflix. And when's like, my pizza going to be delivered? There's a lot more than that. When's my pizza going to be delivered <laughs> so I can watch it with my favorite show? I mean, I... 
I, I, I don't know. The, the food the food thing is puzzling to me, but we really don't. And it gets back to what you mentioned about taking ownership in your health, right? And managing, because managing caloric input, it's simple math. Yeah. And I think that, so that's, that's an interesting point there of something I think should, we should be discussing is I think there's multiple, I shouldn't say multiple aspects to health, but there's multiple things that an individual needs to do in order to be healthy. And I think that we as society say, oh, if I eat well, I'm going to be healthy. And that's all I'm going to focus on. Or if I exercise, I'm going to be healthier. If I take these supplements and then eat terribly and, and don't exercise, I'm going to be healthy. Like it's a combination of lifestyle principles that equate to a healthy individual. And I'm, I, I take supplements myself, but I think you had mentioned earlier, like that magic pill that we can take we need to realize we call them supplements for a reason. They are to supplement a healthy lifestyle, not to replace. So I don't care if you're spending $200 a month on supplements or whatever your number is. If you're not going to the gym, you're not exercising, you're not managing your stress, you're not focusing on your sleep, you're not taking care of your body. Like, 100%. man, you're throwing that money away and you've essentially turned into what I think the marketers of the entire supplement industry want you to do of being reliant on constantly replenish these things, thinking that that's the solution to your inadequacy whenever it comes to your health, your well-being, and where your life's at. Yeah, we want that quick fix, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, want, we want someone to say, hey, so what's your thoughts on, um, I think, this recent trend of – People taking a diabetic injection to lose weight is yeah. it called is it a limbic. Is it? Man, there's a ton of different ones out there, and I am of the that for a, for a minute there was a big like pregnancy hormone. So they were giving men and women pregnancy oh, hormones, great. which ramps up your metabolism and has Can't you lose wait weight. To do that. And you know what the scary part is? There's somebody listening. To it, they're like, oh wait, let me write that down. How do I get that pregnancy hormone? But there are a ton of lose weight quick. I they're gimmicks. Okay, and and the react and. The, I've even had patients that have the lap band surgery. Like, we're going to go in, we're going to do that. They lose the weight, but then they don't change anything. It all comes right back. I know. There is zero. I'm just saying it right now. This is a this is a granite statement. There's zero quick fix to being healthy. It takes constant effort, and I think that's what scares people a lot away, away from becoming healthy because it's not like, oh, I just take this or I do this or I get adjusted once a week. Like whatever it is that somebody gets into their mind of what they need to do, get, do to get healthy, it's when I wake up and when I go to bed and the decisions that I make every single moment in that time is ultimately what it takes to get healthy, and that is a difficult thing for somebody to say, I want that because that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it's a project, right? Project, but what a, I mean, the things that we devote our time to, I mean, you can find people that have hobbies of fishing and hunting and electronics and mu guitar, and we'll put tons of our energy into things like that, yes. but we will not do it for our health. It's crazy. It really is. There's a lot of guys that are, that, that live within just a mile of the studio that could tell you every stat of every stealer that there is and are miserable in multiple aspects of their life because they are trying to say, I'm going to put my time and my energy into this thing that I'm going to be able to watch two hours on a Sunday and, and then neglect everything else. I love the Steelers. I watch them every mm -hmm. week. I'm a big fan, but that's not where I want to be spending my free time of watching all the analysts talking about X, Y, Z. I think hobbies are important. I love to read. Sure. I love to watch baseball. I love to play baseball. Like I have a ton of hobbies, but they are not, they wouldn't define me. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm a hunter or I'm a baseball guy or I'm the guy that sits on the bar stool or like whatever that is. I, I think we should be identified as, you know, a father of somebody in the community that is is making a positive impact of somebody that's, you know, making a positive impact in their church. Like there should be this overwhelming thing that that takes most of our time and that's easier to do that overwhelming thing when we're healthy. And it shouldn't be the fantasy football thing all day. Every I, I, do you do? Fa I haven't done fantasy. No, football, I, I, I think I had hooked into it about twenty years ago for one season. I lasted like four or five games. I'm, I'm like, God, I'm I was here. the opposite. It like took over my life, and I'm like, wait a minute, like this is so silly. Why am I putting so much How time about in the this? Baseball, that's like. Day, that's a gr daily grind. Dude, I'm in the midst of it. My boy right now is in in travel baseball. Oh, it is yeah. every day, every and I love it and I love playing Dr. ball. Alex, that's I'm what he wants to do. You, you did this. You oh, lived this life. I lived it and I loved <laughs> it and I miss it. Take. I mean, I, I would say, you know, my advice would be is enjoy, take pictures and enjoy every All second. Right. Because when it's gone, 
it's gone. Yeah. And oh, like, you mean he's not going to make the show? He's not going to be playing that movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That, that was his career path. But well, for for me, it was like he continued through high school. But it was funny when high school ended and the dream wasn't going to go uh, into college for him. And it ended. It was like, but there was something magical about the end of the uh, Pony League. Yeah. 14 was like the last year. Yeah. And everything, because, you know, when they turn to be 15, you'll see they have a different life. You know, I'll, they're still playing. They're a little, little different there. You know, girl, girls ruin me from baseball. Oh, 15. Yeah, I was like, Wait man. a minute. I could be at the pool. Like, yeah, I don't want to be a practice. Right. <laughs> when they're 14, they're still that little boy. You know what I mean? Doing that thing they love. Yeah. But it just changes. But that, that's, there's a finality at 14. You'll, right. you'll see. I got five more years. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I am enjoying Soak it. It's a grind, in, though, man. We're having, we're having fun. We're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're down in the South Hills, right? Because Moon. Township was where he played, and we went to the South Hills for a lot of tournaments. We actually just got down Scott on the drive up here. We played Montour, drove past them on the way here from the South Hills. Man, they had some they had some boys that could play ball on that team. There was uh, no, there was one top. kid that was bigger than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> let me see a birth, let me see a birth certificate. What are they, feed, what are they feeding this kid? <laughs> um, do you do you think in terms of uh, the process of getting healthy? Do you believe that um, it's just have we we have we've gotten so fat? Have we gotten so big and obese? Have we gone past the point of of and with each year getting bigger, is it just harder because our starting point now keeps getting further and further away from the target weight and the target goals? I think that's a great point. I think we are like actually moving the the starting line backwards yeah. in terms of uh, in terms of the finish line, and I think it is harder now ever to be healthier when it should be the opposite. We have so many. Uh, so much more availability of, of different things that can bring us health. The problem is we're getting sicker at a younger age, which make, takes us out of that thrival mindset that we had talked about earlier and puts us into the survival mindset of, hey, man, I just need to figure out how to, how to get through this particular aspect of my health struggles. Well, the problem is if that's all our focus is, there's going to be another health struggle as soon as you get through this one, if you get through this one. So that's I think good, weights I think weight's an a, a aspect of it, and but – I've I have patients that are in their 80s that are that are overweight. Like I think there's a way to get longevity and life by being over. I shouldn't say by being overweight, but I don't think that that is the end all be all. I definitely would much rather have my patients be you know in that moderate to thin range because I think that there is a ton of health that's associated with that. But I think we as a society have really said weight is the end all be all of what equates to it. It's a player, but it's not it. It's more about am I living a life that's in congruence with the way that my body was created and designed? And if we're living a life that's in congruence with that and we're focusing on long-term goals and not short-term aspirations, that to me is is what equates to to well-being. We have a patient, he's 94 years old, fought in Korea. He still wow. swings sledgehammers outside. Like if he he's he does yard work, he he's like he's my hero. Like to me, if if I can live to 94 years old and still be helping my kids and my grandkids, like man, that's a really, really beautiful thing. I have one grandma left. She's in her mid 80s. And she's never really struggled with her weight. She's always taken care of that. She's made sensible decisions for as long as I can remember. She like always was focusing on health and maybe reading it in magazines or however they did that whenever whenever I was little. Grandma still goes for a walk. She's sharp as a tack. Um, and I think that it, again, when I look at grandma, it's not like, oh, here's the easy fix. To her, it was like, I'm going to eat well. I'm going to manage my stress. I'm going to fall asleep whenever I know I need to fall asleep. And I'm going to physically move my body. And I think if we can do those four things, um, I would encourage people to see a chiropractor because I think there's a ton of benefits to mm -hmm. that. Maybe add those five things in. I, I adjust grandma. I think if we can do those five things, then we've really set ourselves up to have success at, at later aspects of our life. When you look at video clips or film clips from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there was a very telling one I saw. It was uh, just New York City in 1930 or 40. I know something which one you're talking about. It was, and it was so restored so well. But besides that point, everybody is thin. And when you see a portly man or a woman, very rarely women, but if you see a portly man, it was an anomaly. And I would say an adventure into what we had talked about earlier. I bet that portly man was a very wealthy man. 
who overindulged gluttonous. in, in gluttonous. Yeah, because I think that it just came down to we I would imagine that the average American in the 1930s living in New York City probably ate. 1600 calories a day like that was that was enough to sustain them and 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 it is still enough to sustain us today but we've become so big and we've become so large through the antibiotics and the steroids that's in our food supply that it requires in my opinion more caloric intake in order to sustain these larger bodies that we currently have the average male was what probably buck 50 five foot eight now the average male is probably six one uh I don't know. You think they're 200 pounds, the average male right now? I would say I would, probably, I right? I think so. Yeah. I so I think, think we've so. gotten larger, which requires us to consume more food, but I don't think to the extent that we consume it. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, let's say caloric uh, intake should maybe have gone up 20% from right. the body size that we currently have. We're probably at like shoot 40 to 50%. Some people maybe a hundred percent over what it is that they're consuming daily. So let me talk about something too, in regards to body shaming and so forth. Um, because when you think of body shaming, it's like, you know, uh, it's a fine line too, because at what point are we glamorizing obesity? As at what point are we being cruel? Cause no one wants to be cruel. Nobody wants to be cruel. nobody. Yeah. Um, so there's always a fine line there, but the other, we'll set that over here for now. I want to talk about a phenomenon that happened to me when I when I started doing this. I once I got down to like 190 or 187 from people seeing me larger, yeah. then I started getting the comments, which I'm I'm pretty bulletproof. Like you're not really gonna offend me on anything, but it was interesting. The comments that I was too thin, like okay. what, what are you doing? You look sickly. And then once I got into the 170s, oh my god, you are you dying? People were calling my wife thinking I was I never felt better in my life. I was fitting into the clothes that I wanted. I mean, I, and it's funny because I looked at my wife and I said, okay, I'm 172 and people were calling you and telling you like I'm, I'm in a red, I'm, I'm emaciated and just craziness. And I showed her a picture of Burt Reynolds. Okay. In 1974. Sure. He had a killer mustache. I, he did. <laughs> and I showed a picture of like Sean Connery and I showed a picture of like, uh, the BGs, right? Okay. Were the the uh, so called attractive males of the John Travolta of that era? Yes. What their physiques were? Yeah, and they were probably they were bigger than pounds. me. They were yeah. they're they actually in the one sixties, yeah. right? And that was like attractive at that time. And and but I think now you got the wrong what I'm at one seventy two. I'm like emaciated. It's ridiculous. And and I think it is. And and I also think it, it is this weird thing. Whenever it comes to weight, you had mentioned that earlier. Is like very rarely, unless it's like a very close, like your best friend is going to be like, dude, you're getting fat, right? There's maybe one hope. or two people in your life that's going to say, dude, you're, you're, you're letting yourself go. Yeah. And, and to me, like, I love those people because yep. I want somebody to keep me accountable. But there are 75 people in your life be like, bro, you're getting too thin. Like, what's going on here? What is, what do you think that is? Why, why do you think that, that, that happens? What, that is an interesting societal point of view. Oh, it's a thing. Yeah. It is. I mean, they're calling my wife, which, you know, it was unsettling for her too, but, but it was like, I'm, I, meanwhile, I hadn't been this healthy in a long right. time. Yeah, you know, and, but it was, the, but there was a stigma that something has to be wrong because no one, nobody loses, no that. one lives at one seventy two. Yeah. Who lives at one seventy two? That is that is a weird societal uh, point of view, and and it's, I've but seen it's normalized. It myself. What it's I'm saying become is, very normalized. Yeah, yeah, the act of it. I don't care about the scorn. That doesn't bother me. But it's just interesting how we've normalized obesity. Yeah. And, our, and I'm sure not, we just haven't done it. Society in general has done it. Yeah. Now, but what, what about, like, have you ever noticed commercials? Have they normalized it? I think so. And it's not just commercials. It's everywhere that we go. And I think there's probably something good to that. I mean, I, I definitely, like, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, I, I had probably, I, I mean, we knew the girls who were... Mm, doing things that they shouldn't be doing in order to maintain an ideal body weight because mm -hmm. that's what teen magazine and all this. Mm -hmm. So I, th I definitely think there's both sides to it. Certainly. Um, I, I think if we begin to glorify it the way that we glorified really skinny, that it's, I think the population that's going to be most affected are teenage girls. Certainly. Right. hundred percent. So I, I think if we're going to see the kind of the opposite of what we saw in the nineties of girls becoming anorexic to girls becoming obese, because society says that this is what it should be as opposed to, Forget about what society says. Where are you comfortable? 
how is your body, how are you comfortable in your own body? And I think that goes across to every demographic. Mm -hmm. And if we can get to a point where we're saying, and when I say comfortable, I don't mean like if you want to be gluttonous, be gluttonous. I'm saying, what is your body weight? If you're living congruence with the way that you live, somebody, the, the, if you're living congruence with the way the body's designed to live and you weigh 172 or you weigh 215, but you're living congruence with that, mm -hmm. I'm happy with either way. Of course. But to tell somebody that they are either too thin or, or too overweight because society as a whole says this is the ideal, to me, that's the problem. And I think healthcare in general needs to become much more individualized. Certainly. And a lot less um, broadly focused. And the interim, and I'm going to probably upset a lot of people in, in medicine and even chiropractic when I say this, but the interim right now um, is evidence-based. Medicine and chiropractic, like that's the, 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 the term. And my beef with evidence-based medicine is that it is a very generalized. Everybody should have a blood pressure of X. Everybody should have a BMI of Y. And man, we're two human beings that are sitting here that are completely different. Right. And we are going to have different body types and, and different blood pressures and different cholesterol levels and all of this. And I'm not saying that we just throw the science out the window, but I'm saying we as a society need to say... Eric McKenna is healthy not because he meets all of society's metrics. Eric McKenna is healthy because he meets Eric McKenna's metrics. Right. And if we can get healthcare and science to that is, to me, how we change societal health outcomes. Why isn't it done that way now? It's too difficult. We don't. I, I think as we – I'm terrified of AI. I'm, I really am. Like I've seen all the movies. You've seen all the movies. I think it's pretty neat. Like I've used it, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. But I think what <laughs> – Have you seen some of those pictures it's drawn? <laughs> it's wild, right? But I think what that technology allows us – is to create baselines for individuals and not for societies. And when we're focusing on an individual's health metrics, as opposed to trying to fit Eric McKenna into a box that is exists in society, that's how we change the unfortunate health outcomes that we're currently in. Someone comes to you and uh, they open up a conversation and say, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm six foot, and doctor, I'm 250 pounds and I'm serious now. I'm really serious about finally making some changes here. Like, wh wh what's the first thing you do? Why? Mm, you want to find out there why. That's it, man. Like that, that to me, if, if we have a, and, and you know, it's like that nineties motivational thing and it sounds completely heady, but if I can know why you want to lose the weight and I can know what your motivating factor is for lack of a better term, now I can poke the bear, right? If you want to lose weight because you want to fit into a size 32, you'll fit into a size 32 if you have grit and determination, but you'll probably back end up in the 40 because mm -hmm. your why was just this mm -hmm. esoteric. I want to fit into a, th mm -hmm. if your why is like, man, I'm, I'm seeing my son now in his twenties and, and I want to be around for, for my grandchildren. I want to be able to have a catch with them in the backyard. Yeah. I'm like, there's a dude that's going to lose the weight. Correct. That's the guy right there that I want to work with. And as weird as that is to sound, like I, I think I've had conversations with people and in the back of my head, I'm like, I want you to lose the weight, dude, but that, that ain't it, man. Like until you go out in the world and figure out why yeah. you're going to get healthy. It wasn't a strong enough pool. No, man. Like that's just, it's just not it. Like you take a look at our athletes, like the, the greatest athletes in the world. We, Michael Jordan, we, we essentially turned this guy into a God because all he wanted to do his entire life was about winning. Well, he's going to go out and win because he's, that's his cornerstone. That's, that's his, that's his ego. That's who he is. If your ego is to fit into a smaller uh, pant size or a dress size, you're like the twelfth man on the basketball team. It's, it's it's not you're there, great, but you're not you're not going to be immortalized. Yeah, so the mission is, needs to be broader. You want to know? Like, it is judgmental to a degree, though. Like it, it, it's it's what do you say? Because to me, I want I I challenged myself. You know, a month into the process, hey, I, I want to go wear the same size I wore in high school. It wasn't my sole motivator. I was afraid of COVID. Like, yeah. I'm 242. I'm going to figure out if I – I'm probably going to guess if I get my weight down, 
I'm no longer going to be in the comorbidity. That's it, man. Group. So that's it. That's that's that a why. Motivated. That's a why. I don't want to die from this yeah. terrible, scary thing that's <laughs> out in the world. I don't want to die. It's yeah. about as heavy as you can get. <laughs> yeah, and in that in that point of time, I mean, that's it, man. Like that's what our our focus was. Um, but I, I think that in order to maintain that, we're, we're out of the pandemic. Like, yeah. what is it now? And I think our why should probably always be evolving. Like my why before I had kids was, yeah, I think it'd be cool to travel the world in my 90s. Like. Right. Man, I don't care if I'm in Australia in my 90s. I want to be in the backyard with my great grandson having absolutely. a catch. Like absolutely, that 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 yep. type of mindset and that type of thought. I I, I think that's that's the solution. I think too. I, I mean, we do slide a lot, right? We're the, uh, humans do the yo-yo thing when it comes to weight, right? And I think what's kept me out of it is just recognizing that the quality of life that I have at this weight. I mean, I just would, I just never want to go back to that. I can't imagine like 70 pounds. I lift, lift up 70 pounds in my basement. And I'm like, this was on my back. I was, you know, and I walk with a 20 pound weight vest and that's a moderate amount of weight, but it's 70 pounds. So 20, 20, that's, that's, that's good. So what, we we had mentioned earlier uh, Peter Atia. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm reading a book, listening to a book right now called Outlive, and he's big into rocking and lift, lift moving body weight. And his his philosophy is is he works with people that want to become centenarians, and those are people that live to a hundred yes. and not just hit that number. That's yeah, me. Hello. 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 Right. Um, that, but that live to that with like some vibrance. vitality, yeah, yeah. And some vitality. And his his thought process is like, okay, so if you want to have vitality, that means that you've got to be able to to walk up steps you've got to be able to get in and out of cars you've got to be able to move your body weight if you fall so like his thought process and i think it's actually a beautiful thought process is if you want to be able to walk up a flight of steps in your 80s and 90s to visit your grandkids you damn well better be able to run up a flight of steps in your 60s and if that's where you're at in your 60s then you get to 90 of being able to do those things that allow you to to reach that Got point it. isn't that beautiful and i never really thought of it that way like man it's walking up steps like even in my radar of something that i've ever thought of as a goal well i'm not living in an 80 year old's body my my um wife's grandfather loved him to death took me in and he's he's a he's a wonderful guy but he's really struggling with his mobility right now and getting around and i'm starting to look at that now and be like okay so living to an old age is is one thing but living to an old age of being able to do the things that you want to do is a completely other thing and i think that's also a point that medicine has gotten us to is medicine will make the argument that long that life expectancies are going up and we can make the argument that maybe they're not but all we've really done over the last 100 years is allowed a human being to live longer with a sickness and a disease as opposed to living longer with health. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think that to me, and we keep coming back to the healthcare and where it needs to go, it needs to go to living long with life. Yeah. And it's sad when I talk to people who, you know, when the conversation comes up as to how long they want to live, it's sad when you hear commentary from some folks like, well, I don't ever want to live past 80. You know, I just don't want to be, I, I don't want to live like that. And, I'm, and, and so their inputs of what they think 80 is, it's a shame that they think that way. Do you and, know what I mean? Yes. And I'm going to take that a step further. I think they think 80 is terrible because 40 is bad right now. And if 40 is bad, can I imagine how 80 is going to feel? So how do we fix that? We fix 40. We don't worry about 80 right now. We fix 40 right now to a get to a point where we're saying, all right, I'm this is it, man. And this is what I want to maintain through the rest of my life. Everybody that I've ever met that has made that statement, looking back on it, like, eh, you're probably not happy with where you're at right now. And that's why you only see it getting worse into your 80s and your 90s. Let's fix now, man. Like, let's let's make it better. Yeah, it, it's just it really... And I think, I just think, doctor, people look at the whole health and fitness thing, especially if they know they're overweight and they're not in the best of quote unquote shape. They just look at it as an insurmountable mountain that it's easier not to think about it, but it's okay to go grab that other can of Coke. You know, like it's just, it's easier to drink the Coke because it's instant gratifying. But I know it'd feel great if I'd fix this and it would be great. But the can of Coke is there staring at them, and it's just a, it's an easier and quicker and more, I don't know, it's an easier gratification. It is. How do you break that? You stop focusing, you stop focusing on you. Because to me, that is a selfish decision. 
I don't care who you are, where you're at in your life. I don't care if you're single and you don't have any kids. Like there's somebody in the world that loves you, that cares about you. And an individual who takes that mode of thought, in my opinion, is thinking solely about themselves. And that's how society falls apart, in my opinion. Like I should be living my life, yes, for me, but to to some extent – for my immediate family, for my 100%. extended family, for my family, for the patients who've put me into some type of um, hierarchy whenever it comes to their health and their well-being, like it goes so much beyond me. So in my opinion, stop being so selfish and right. stop living exclusively for you and start living for the people who who love you and care about you. Yeah, it's a mind shift. And I think most people are good people. I believe that. And it's just they've got to have, you know. Sometimes it just takes a question, right? They, if no one's ever asked them that question. Like, what is why? your real reason? Your, what why? is your why? Yeah. So once we've established that why, like what, why, why is it that you want to do that? Now we'll begin to facilitate some action steps to do that. Okay. Um, but until until we're, we're pretty set on that's a good one, let's not worry about figuring out what you're going to eat and how you're going to exercise because you could figure it out. You could be the best in the world at putting that together. But all I've done is help you lose 30, 40, 50 pounds or help, help you reach some specific type of health goal that I know. And when I put my head down at night, like, yeah, that guy's going to put it all back on. He's going to be back in the same boat in five years, 10 years, whatever that looks like, as opposed to, man, I don't care if I am disappeared from this planet tomorrow. That guy's why was big enough. And we gave him the the foundational lifestyle principles that even if I'm gone, yeah. even if his health guru are gone or whoever it is that he's relying on, if they disappear tomorrow, that individual is equipped to make those decisions. Healthcare, in my opinion, needs to become individual ap- a- a- approach and not societal approach. I've had this conversation with with other individuals. It's like it needs to become, you know, we make the argument that healthcare is very capitalistic, and it is, but it also needs to become more capitalistic. It needs to focus on the individual and not communistic on focusing on society at large. Okay. And I, again, I, I realize that making that statement upsets a lot of people, but I want people to be healthy. That's kind of my purpose here on the planet. That's what I foresee myself as, as a father and helping somebody to get healthy. And the healthiest individuals that I know are individuals that are making decisions that are congruent with where they stand and right. not what is going to be fitting into XYZ category. And I realize that we're, we're talking about things that are very difficult to talk about, but Healthy individuals are individuals. They're thinking about what's in in the best interest for them and for their family and not trying to fit themselves into some type of a box. Okay. Before we wrap this up, I want to ask you about big pharma for a second. I mean, I'm not coming at it from a conspiratorial nature. The question I have is, you know, I think any rational human can understand that we've got some significantly bad diseases out there that require... Um, treatment and science has given us tremendous medicines for those things. Yeah. It's it's the maintenance things, the drugs to it's the drugs that we get to combat our laziness. Like if you get cancer, you're not because you're a lazy person. It's it's I hate to say this, unluck of the draw. That's what it is. If you have type 2 diabetes, there's a strong probability, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was self-inflicted based upon diet. So the maintenance drugs to to take place of our laziness, that's, I think, where the average person looks at Big Pharma and gets pissed off. And I think we as a society need to become more pissed off at that particular mindset. There is zero money to be made in curing sickness. Zero. That's not how healthcare is set up. The money in healthcare is getting an individual to take a drug and becoming reliant on that drug and being a customer of that drug for the duration of their life. Of course. So in, in, until that system is fixed, we should continue to be upset at Big Pharma. And we should also be con- upset kind of at ourselves because we're allowing that system to continue to propagate and to continue to exist. Whereas opposed to... And I don't think that there is a cure, pharmaceutically speaking, for the vast majority of, of diseases. I, I'm not here to say drugs are terrible, that doctors are terrible, that pharmacies are terrible, and that you know that we should have that we should just like 
throw that off of a cliff. Right. But, but I am here to say that that system is only profitable if you are sick and can propagate that sickness. And I don't think there's a drug on the planet that that truly effectively cures. We can maybe make an argument for an antibiotic or something along those lines, which, by the way, are not very profitable for the pharmaceutical companies, no. right? So until we realize that the drug isn't going to be our solution, it can be there as a as a life preserver if and when we get to ourselves to a situation where something nefarious or bad has happened to our body, that we're making decisions to avoid pharmaceuticals, then we've fixed it. I know you said you wanted to wrap this up, but I, I want people to begin to wrap their mind around this. Cool. All right. So there's two there's two approaches to becoming healthy. There's this allopathic model, okay. which states that the body is uh, stupid, that it does bad things, and that we need to manage the body. And that's essentially medicine. Then there's this vitalistic approach that the body is incredibly intelligent, that everything that the body does is a response to some type of stress. So let me pose this to you. You eat something terrible, Mm -hmm. something that um, you have legit food poisoning and you start throwing that up and you start defecating that out. Mm -hmm. Medicine looks at that and say, we need to get him an anti-nausea and we need to get him an anti-diuretic because he's vomiting and has diarrhea. Where the vitalistic approach is that body's doing everything within its power to get that toxin outside of it. And it's going to push it out of the mouth and it's going to push it out of the anus so that it's gone where medicine can come in and help. There is let's make sure that they're hydrated. Let's make sure that they are not depleted of certain um, um, phytonutrients and different minerals. But we want to go and say, we want to do the anti of whatever the body's doing an anti diuretic. If I go outside and my allergies flare up, and I start coughing real bad, or I get real mucusy. the allopathic model says, take something to knock that mucus out, take something to stop coughing. The vitalistic approach is, coughing is beautiful. There's an irritant in the lung, the body's trying to get that out. There's an irritant in the nasal passage, so we're going to put all this mucus there so that it doesn't get into the lungs, and we don't have an upper respiratory infection. So until we realize and begin as society and to teach our children that oftentimes the things that mommy and daddy tell you is wrong with the body are actually these wonderful responses by the body to keep us well and to get a pathogen, a sickness, a virus, it's or a bacteria. Care of itself. Yes. Sometimes the best thing to do with the body is to do nothing. nothing. Just let this a beautiful intelligence, we call it innate intelligence in chiropractic, run and govern the body. And when that gets out of control, then medicine steps in. But if wow. we tell a kid, wow. if we tell yeah. if we tell a kid like here's here's a medicine the, the moment that a body does something wrong, you're coughing, you're sneezing, you got diarrhea, here's a medication, here's a medication, here's a medication. We're indoctrinating that child that the body is stupid and that any time that I don't feel well, I need to be reliant <laughs> on a medicine. Okay. Now I take this a step further when I'm having conversations with a kid. So let's say that that kid is having some issues. Um, as a kid, and they'd say, okay, medicine solves me. The people who love me and the most give me this medication when I'm not well. The doctors who's the smartest person that mommy and daddy know that they go to, they give me this medication. Now that kid gets to college, and I'm talking about me. And life becomes hard, and it's stressful, and uh, I'm sick, and I'm in a difficult field of study, and I'm away from home, and I'm stressed out of my mind. What's the solution? Well, it's got to come from outside of the body. Let's crack open a couple of beers. Let's go to a, let's let's see how much liquor that I can drink. Like, let me numb that with an outside solution. And I'm using my air quotes there. So I think we really set ourselves up not only becoming reliant on medication, but solving life's problems with a medication when they arise. There is certainly a time wow. and a place wow. for solving issues with medications, but it can't be our primary focus. And until that changes, American and societal health is going to continue to decrease. Mm, So it's more of a hands-off approach when it comes to uh, your health uh, in regards to big pharma. Like you're saying less chemicals, less medicine, is the solution medicine used appropriately is the solution and medicine used as a primary response to a body's innate response is criminal 
Got it. And I, man, I get it. That's a, that's a tough statement to make, and that's hard for me to say because I know I'm upsetting you're a talking, of your you, listeners. You're man. talking to a guy right now. I don't. I am on no medication Good whatsoever. For you. And that nothing. should be celebrated. Like nothing. you realize you are nothing. I look at you as a unicorn, as like this wonderful <laughs> thing. You go that 94 year old guy. You want me to tell you a funny story about this guy? He goes, Doc. I went to the doctor for the first time in 20 years, and I'm like, Man, you've told me forever. Like you try to avoid these guys. The, the doctors you had in your 70s were all younger than you and not nearly as healthy. And they're asking you for questions of what it is you're doing. I'm like, why'd you go to the doctor? He goes, well, they told me if I go, they give me a $50 subway gift card. <laughs> so, so I went in, but he was the same as you, man. Like he got to a point where the, they would run every test in the world and be like, man, you're good. You don't need any medications. And, and I think healthy people take less medications. And I think that is a, a, mm, product, a byproduct of being healthy, but it's also decisions that have been made to realize there's no chemical in the world that's a solution to my problems. The solution to my problems are going to rely somewhere outside of a pharmacological, pharmacological agent. Again, I, I just I can't stress it enough. I'm not telling people to throw their medications down the toilet. Not at all. No, there's a time and a place for them 100%, but they, they can't be our primary source of promoting healthcare in right. the United States. Right. And it definitely is. And probably across the world, right? I mean, is it, or, or it, let me ask you this, are we the most medicated yes. country on the planet? hundred um, percent. So here's, here's the numbers that, that I have. Now these numbers are old, so they've probably gotten bigger, but America makes up 5% of the world's population. Do you have any idea what percentage of the world's medications we take? Mm. 87% of the world's medications are consumed here in the United States. So Holy we are smokes. hands down the most medicated society on the face of the planet. And you take a look at our health outcomes in terms of comparing ourselves to apples to apples. Like we're not comparing ourselves to a third world nation. There are some nations, third world nations who have better health outcomes than we do. Um, but when we compare ourselves to many other industrialized nations, we fall in, in obesity rates, uh, diabetes rates, heart disease, cancer, depression, like all of the, the real issues that we as Americans suffer from um, are not solved by medications because if they were, we should be the healthiest population on the face of the planet if medications were the solution. We're not. There's two uh, countries in, in the world where you're allowed to directly market a drug to a healthy population from TV to marketing on the internet and magazines. It's the United States and New Zealand. You are not, you will not see a drug ad. Ask your doctor if XYZ is right for you in any other country on the face of the planet outside of the United States and New Zealand. Is that hard to believe? Yeah. Very, yeah, much so. it, Very much it, so. And it, it really, it, it, it's, it's scary when you begin to like take the blinders off and just oh, it's look an industry. at it. It is the industry. I, I challenge that the, the healthcare industry at 20% of the gross domestic product, like who else is even close to that? Is, is, is big oil close to that? Maybe, but like, we're talking not billions of dollars. We're talking trillions of dollars that are pumped into that system. And I think that, the throwing money at that and throwing drugs at that, at this point, we should just look back and saying, this is the definition of ins insanity. It's not getting better. We need a better approach. And until that approach is propagated on a large scale to the American population, we're going to continue to suffer as a result of that. It's that mentality that there's got to be a doctor that can give me a pill that will solve something. And that is the that is the 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 issue. And I, again, I think that starts in infancy. And I think that starts with that story that we had talked about earlier with drugs to kids being the solution to X, Y, Z symptoms. And until that's fixed, um, I don't think we fix it. Could it be a seismic event that, that would change something like that? Or do you, th you, do you see no end in sight? I like to think that it's solved with a grassroots root solution. I think it's it solved with more and more people beginning to realize and look at the numbers and the statistics and the, and the data that exists out there and is real and is manageable and tangible that we can see, that we can feel, that we can understand. Um, I think that it's families individually beginning to make decisions that this system is failing us and I am not going to continue to put my family uh, and my life into a system that fails. I'm going to figure out and find a new system. Um, I think the system exists in eating well, exercising, taking care of your spine, minimizing stress and avoiding toxins. If you can do those five things, which is the, the tenets of what we help our patients with in the clinic, if you can do those five things, then you've begun to 
distance yourself from the medical system. And the beautiful thing about the medical system is that it's not going to go away. If you get hit by a car, get hit by a car in the United States. If you're going to have a terrible injury, do that in the United States because our our crisis care situation here is second to none. We're beautiful of fixing that. But if you have diabetes- Cancer as well too, like cancer? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, if we want to go down that that rabbit hole, I I think there's a yes and a no. The problem with cancer statistics is that, so I had mentioned earlier, my mom is a cancer survivor of 20 years. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers and the data, my mom has beat cancer one time. But the way that the data is written on cancer survival rates is that if you live and survive from five years after your diagnosis with cancer, you're a survivor. So my mom hasn't beat cancer once. She hasn't beat it twice. She hasn't beat it three times. She's beat it four times. It doesn't matter if you have cancer um, and you live five years in one day. You are a cancer survivor and a cancer of death at the same time. So it cancels itself out. It's very difficult to what look at those up with numbers. Those, with that math? It's the only disease process that we track that way. So who comes up with that math? I mean, we could be facetious and we could say that it's the pharmaceutical industrial complex. We could say that it's um, just a convenient way of tracking it because cancer is so problematic. And if we can get somebody to live for five years, that's a wonderful thing. But the math on cancer is very difficult to understand. And I'm not going to say that I can understand it. All I can say is that if you have heart disease for five years in one day, you didn't and, and you die, you didn't survive it and die from it. You just you just died from it. And our statistical analysis on cancer does not follow those rules. That's crazy. It's scary. It is scary. So it's hard to answer that question on cancer. And I don't know the answer to that. I know our cancer rates are very high here compared to other industrialized nations. Um, I don't know if other nations follow the same guidelines of the five years uh, survival rates. And that is a true survivor. So uh, th- that is that is a difficult answer to question. Uh, question to answer and i don't even know if the best statistical analysis individual on the planet could could give us a a solid answer on that it's a it's 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 a game that the rules it's like playing baseball with football rules it just it it doesn't it doesn't mesh it's weird overall we just need to start taking ownership of our lives in general and certainly our health I yes. mean, as the biggest component of that, right? And, and I, mean, I hope that's the takeaway message that our listeners certainly. are getting today is that the cards are essentially stacked against us and we need to realize that. And we need to realize that because the, the cards are stacked against us that we really need to work and we need to put effort into this and we need to study and we need to practice and we need to surround ourselves with individuals who are going to help us um, understand, I guess is the right term, of the appropriate action steps for me to take and not for X, Y, Z individual to take. And if we can find somebody to hold our hand through that process, then we've begun to set ourselves up for, in my opinion, a healthcare model that brings success long-term and not sickness and propagation of disease long-term. Amen to that. Did you have a good time? Man, I had a blast. I wish we could keep going. I'd love- I got to go see some patients, man. Yeah, hey, this guy's got important work to do. I'd love for you to come back. All right, man. Yeah, let's let's yeah. let's figure that we do, out. We this do some fun. um we do some panel shows too. Just we call the Four Friends series. And okay. We just pick talk- topics out and we just kind of go and have a good time with it. Cool. Yeah. No, I, I I would love to have those conversations. Yeah. So um, how can they reach you? All the ways they can reach you. <laughs> I guess there's a a couple. Um, I guess Instagram is probably the e- easiest. Doctor Alex Pgh. Uh, the clinic is City of Bridges Chiropractic. We're on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, it, our website, drpatterson.maxliving.com. And on there is actually an opportunity. You don't even have to call our clinic to schedule an appointment. Somebody yeah, very can cool. schedule themselves virtually, cool. which is nice. Um, so those would be my big three, um, Instagram, Facebook, and the website. And, you, and the, the radio show has concluded? Yeah, man. So <clears throat> I did live radio for four three years right on and it was fun it was a blast it was like a shot of adrenaline every saturday morning but i didn't essentially finish my work week until noon on saturdays and when i had my son i was like man like there's just more important things that i need to be doing so i've tried really hard and on our facebook page i took a lot of the radio show programs that we were doing and turned them into a live discussion with uh, the other doctor in my clinic, Dr. Alex Swagger, who's awesome, right. great friend. Right. And we discuss um, different health topics. So we've talked about uh, inflammation. We've talked about- I've lost uh, a bunch yeah. of them. So, so um, to me, I, I think 
it just made my life easier to say, we're done with live radio. Let's figure out different means of getting this out. And maybe it was done in a selfish waste, but if I'm selfish in order to be no, uh, a better it. father, I'll, 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 be, I, I'll choose selfish every I day. I totally understand <laughs> that decision. Um, podcasting suits you. I mean, the, this, this format in general, you, you mean, have you thought about just doing a full blown show? I, I have. And I'm going to be honest. One of the reasons I reached out to you is like, man, do I, do I want to do this? And then I walk in here and you got this, <laughs> well, this beautiful... is kind of weird. So. No, man, this is like, to me, I'm like, all right, I'm doing this. Like I, I, I need to go run a space. I need to get all this cool swag up here. Um, no, I, I just like talking health. I like talking, yep. uh, solutions. And, and I think this is a beautiful platform. Well, and I really am thankful that you're you... an accomplished speaker and you're very comfortable behind the mic and that's you know that's just some people have it or they don't you can develop skills but either have it or you don't and you definitely have that ability my first, to communicate my first live radio show program like the <laughs> mic was shaking i'm terrified i did it with a buddy and he's looking at me like are you okay like what's happening to you over there so this is not natural this is this is uh this is a lot of a lot of breaking stuff behind the mics in well, order to I, just out. so you don't feel bad i'll share this with you uh, <laughs> i did realtor radio for a couple of years on down in wbvp and uh, 2016 was my first show i go there it's an hour long and you know there's going to be like commercial breaks and things so i had a 45 minutes i had to fill up right oh you're just, by yourself yeah, by myself <gasps> and just me and a producer saturday morning i come in with my thing i've got what i want to talk about and Show starts and I'm kind of like somewhat reading off the script and, and keep reading and like making it conversational, you know, and then the first break comes. And the guy goes, okay, what are we going to talk about in the second break during the commercial? I'm like, I don't know, I'm out of stuff. <laughs> I was out of material. I used all my top material. In like 12 <laughs> minutes, it was all gone. I didn't know what I was. And you have to wing it. You got to wing you it. just figure it out. And right? that was the adrenaline rush with live <clears throat> radios. Like, it was really cool. Then sometimes you get the callers, and the call some callers were great. Like I, I like that that aspect of like, all right, let me let me ask answer some real questions. And you know, you I'm they again, screen them for you? No, oh, man. Mine like, weren't screened no, either. Yeah, here's Rick from <laughs> from from uh, Hazelwood, whoever it was to call in. And like more often than not, it was great. Like it, it created dialogue. It was fun. But then you get you get Joey. Yinzer, and now I'm saying that in the nice one because I'm you're Yinzer right. as Yinzer oh, gets, man. Right. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have some real, real live ones. Oh, it was crazy. <laughs> down down that, that station, uh, there was a you know, there, there was an older demographic of listeners, and they call in, what time's the football game on today? <laughs> and you're like, oh, it was, uh, it was just a game. Yeah. yeah like, you know, it was, it was you know, wait, wait, are you, I, need to, I need to pick up my, I won something yesterday. I need to come down to the station and pick it up. I'm like, Oh, okay i'm not i'm not your guy i don't know how you got on i don't have anything for you but yeah it's a live radio but it was great and then um i did it for three years in rock Cozen and i went down for a year and did a show there and okay. we loved it but it, it it's podcasting is taking some of the luster of it away I, I think so. And I think the cool thing about podcasting is like, I don't have to be in front of my device at nine o'clock on Saturday morning. Like I could tune in at the, on the treadmill, I can tune in on the flight or whatever it is that I'm doing. That's the beautiful thing about this platform. And I, you know, again, like I, I really appreciate you asking me on because oh, I, I see the, the shows that you've show. had on the years that you've been doing this. Like it's really a beautiful thing. And I hope our conversation today, uh, really helped some people and upset minimal. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I mean, it was, I, it was it was rewarding for me. I got a lot out of it, and it's a conversation, and and, I, and that's the beauty of this. This is not, you know, they say this is an interview format. Yeah, I guess there's a small amount of our conversation was interview based, but the the essence of what we're doing is we're trying to foster in-person conversations yeah i think it was cool i mean it was definitely a little nerve-wracking like i i asked like what are you gonna ask me like no we're just, we're just gonna talk <laughs> <laughs> all right man yeah that's that's my weird <laughs> skill set yeah i can i the, un, the unvarnished nature of just going at it and having fun and, and 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 i think i like it because in some way um i kind of make my guests like like uh be nimble on their feet for the first couple of minutes till they get the lay of the land and they, they settle into a conversation. Yeah. I think you, right? I think you handled that like a master. That was great. Well, I'm about a master, but I, I'm getting used to just fostering this type of dialogue as opposed to reading off of, okay. And in, in a March of 1990, you did this and like, okay. I mean, but no one really wants to ingest that. Right. 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 You know, but again, thank you. No, we'll, do this again. Me, we'll do this again, my cool. friend. Cool. Cool. All cool. right. We're out. Thank you. <laughs>